Please welcome Bishop O.C. Allen III. Susan Salney is back to lead the conversation. <laughs> Thank you again. I want to start off by telling the audience just a little bit more about you. You're a Christian pastor. I am. Pentecostal bishop. Yes. Openly gay. Yes. Married to your life partner. Yes. <laughs> and you believe that religious leaders have a role in the fight against HIV AIDS. What is that role? Well, first of all, first of all, thank you for having me. I don't know why you all would have a Pentecostal at the end of the program, but, <laughs> uh, well, I think the, the faith leaders role is just that it is, uh, the faith leaders job to inspire, to bring hope, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, galvanize, to organize, uh, and particularly as a black pastor, you know, I am part of a legacy of uh, social justice. I always tell people that, um, you know, our rights, whether it is voting, uh, whether it is being able to sit where you want to sit, that was baptized in blood. You know, there are people that gave their lives uh, for our ability to mobilize and to create movement. And so particularly in my tradition, it is uh, the, the one job, the main job, to inspire social justice. Uh, I believe that is one of the main roles. I think the other role is healing justice. And um, that means that part of my job is uh, reconciliation and restoration and providing opportunities for people to heal from a host of issues, whether they are personal, uh, but also uh, political and social. And I think the very last thing, which is probably the most complicated, and that is uh, sexual justice. And so, you know, I learned everything about sex in church. <laughs> I, uh, or in, and I, I think that is pretty consistent with most folks. Uh, our, our concepts, our construct, our theology, our philosophy, uh, sociology, everything about sexuality, oftentimes as people of faith comes from the church or the mosque or the temple. And so it is, is our job to, as faith leaders, to uh, examine what we're teaching and what we're uh, inspiring people to believe about themselves and the community around them. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience with the church? You're in Atlanta. Yes. Um, in whether the it's always been a positive experience or how you handle critics within the church who might not agree with how you preach and who you are? I don't. <laughs> you don't, you don't. Well, you know, what, what I mean is, you know, I found out over time that you have to be consistent with your passion and your beliefs and your call uh, and also understand that there will be people that don't agree that don't affirm what you believe. But if I'm a leader, I have to be at the forefront of uh, whether it is justice, but my own personal life. You know, there has to be consistency with my personal uh, philosophies and the public theology that I preach. I started off that way. My husband and I, when we started the church, we said that we would be authentic, that we would be honest, that this is what it is. Right. We are married, uh, but we are also uh, Christians. And, and from my perspective, I didn't see um, any challenge between being openly gay and being a Christian, because from my perspective, Christianity is about God's love for the whole world. Uh, that includes LGBTQI folk. Um, so I didn't, I didn't see any, any challenge uh, between that. I knew that other people did, but, you know, I think that's, that's, that's life. Ministering to your community, it's often a very emotional challenge for you. We were talking in the green room for a moment about the number of funerals that you do. And can you tell me a little bit about how you handle those sorts of situations? Oh, uh, you know, I... I, I appreciate um, the conversations that we've had uh, today. And, you know, there's, there's so many 
layers to the conversation when we talk about HIV and AIDS. I know that in certain communities, particularly white gay male communities, uh, the white gay com male community, uh, that rates have decreased. Uh, but, you know, within my community, uh, the rates continue to increase. In the South, um, half of new infections are in the South. Uh, and I, I think it's a challenge. You know, as I said to you in the, in the green room, I, a month ago, did the funeral, the eulogy of another member. This year, I have buried a number of young black gay men in their 20s that by the time they connected with the faith community or the church, they had already experienced tortured readings of scripture. They had already experienced um, the complexity of being who they were in a world that oftentimes did not accept them. And because of that, they did not always generally take care of themselves. They didn't feel it was worth it. Uh, and so, as I said to you, I told my congregation that Sunday after that funeral that I wasn't doing any more funerals. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> My, of course, everyone kind of gasped when they said, well, you're the pastor. How, how can you not do funerals? And of course, I will do funerals. But I was trying to make the point that it is not okay to eulogize uh, someone over something that I believe you don't have to die from. You can live. You can be whole. You can move forward. You can achieve all that you want to achieve. And... Uh, I just don't believe that we are going to be able to um, change this epidemic if we don't come together, not just the black community, but it has to matter to the white community. The white cis hetero normative community has to feel that this is a part of their burden also for us to make a difference. Now, you've been working hard outside the church as well. You were on President Obama's HIV yeah. AIDS task force. What were the goals and did you all come to meeting them? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think we met the major goals. Uh, when I was appointed, um, we were updating the national AIDS strategy, which gave direction and guidance, uh, set the goals, we updated the goals. And uh, we had an opportunity to engage community. And I was very happy about that. Um, I am happy about what the administration, the Obama administration um, uh, attempted to do. And of course, then the next uh, administration, uh, we were fired. <laughs> You're fired. Yes, yes. Um, it's just out of existence, the board doesn't exist it anymore? It does not exist. Okay. Um, however, you know, I, I appreciate all, you know, there are probably policymakers in the room. Uh, and I, I, I really uh, want to honor that. But I will say that even beyond the strategy, I appreciate the strategy. Uh, and I appreciate the guidance around policy and how we make policies and what the policy should be. But at the end of the day, uh, people are more important than policies. And so with or without Pacha, with or without uh, a guidance. Uh, it has to matter to us. I, I, I you know, I, I, I tell my congregation, um, you know, <laughs> Pharaoh, if to use that analogy, Pharaoh, let us go, but we have to let Pharaoh go. It is our responsibility as human beings to care for each other, but also understand that we have the power to change anything that we want to change. Uh, this current administration has said that it wants to make America great again. Uh, well, first of all, I believe that, you know, we need to make America right and not necessarily right again, because I think America has had a struggle from the very beginning to be right. But at the end of the day, beyond government, beyond laws and policies, it's about the people. This nation is made up of people. And if we 
ever could ever really just understand our power, uh, you know, we could do anything. Yeah. I'm going to take it to the audience in, in just a moment. But uh, on a slightly lighter note, Ebony Magazine uh, named your family one of the coolest black families in America. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How does it feel to lead by example that way? Oh, wow. What did that validation mean to you? I, I, it was wonderful. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, we, we, my, my husband and I kind of laugh because we're, we're a regular, boring, old couple. We have two beautiful kids. <laughs> Uh, and we are family just like any other family. I, I do think that what was really clear is that the world is changing slowly, step by step. And sometimes it can feel like, you know, we make one step and we take three steps back. But the world is changing. Because just, you were the first yeah, same-sex loving couple we were the to first be same sex. featured that way in Ebony. Yes, it was absolutely a, a, an amazing uh, thing. You know, the world is changing, and I think that while we see how dark these times can be, particularly for those of us who are progressives, um, we need to see that there is still light. There is still light. The world is changing, and we can make a difference. Okay, we have a question. Good morning. My name is Linda Scruggs. Um, and just not to sound homophobic, not to sound like the mad black woman or the woman who's had some issues with race, but I will acknowledge as a black woman living with HIV that um, I don't see me or the sisters in any of this space. And I don't want, there's a lot of white face in this room, and I don't want folks to walk away with that this is still just an LGBT community. Mm -hmm. I unfortunately, but fortunately, spend this last year talking to hundreds and thousands of individuals in the U.S. Stigma is still real. Mm -hmm. We have young women, literally in the last four months, I've met probably two young women who were diagnosed HIV positive and connect their infection still to young men who are not on the down low, but haven't had the privilege to be honest in their true sexual identity. Um, so I, I want to make sure in the room, I, I know I run the risk of being homophobic. I know that. And that's okay. It's Linda H. Scruggs when we're tweeting. But I want to make sure that we bring women, and women are still part of this epidemic. We're more than 150,000 strong. Um, we are still becoming infected. But constantly, we're not getting into this message. We're not getting. I understand the increased rates, but I also want to make sure that we are not invisible. Um, when we bring trans women in the church, I'll tell you, I'm an ordained minister, and I appreciate you awesome. in that space. And I do appreciate this space, how we affirm. But I also want us not to, no longer we're the vectors of the epidemic. So now we become visible in this space. Thank you for that. Your church has done work um, toward that. Oh, goal, yes. Right? Yes. Uh, the beauty of uh, our congregation and the complexity of it is that we are diverse in every single way and everybody from people that grew up traditionally Christian to people who grew up Muslim to, uh, you know, we have a mother's board, <laughs> which you may not know what a mother's board is, some of you, uh, but it is this space where the senior women uh, in the church or the traditional church are affirmed, if you will. Uh, and we, we just, we have young people, old people, uh, people from every kind of background and you know, I will say, I thank you for raising that, sister. Uh, I, I do know that uh, we have to do a better job of creating not just a safe space, but a bold space of diversity. Uh, yet it is always complicated, you know, it, it, it's complicated. And, and I think this conversation helps us to keep the uh, complexities of this conversation. The energy alive. Uh, yeah. Alive well, I thank you so forefront. much for your input. Please yeah. join me in thanking yeah. Bishop Allen. Thank you.